What I was doing that morning. I was picking the last of the sweet tomatoes. I had just put Beatrice down because my back was giving me some trouble. I stooped down and I felt a shadow cut across my back. And when I stood up, four soldiers were smiling at me. Wicked schoolboy smiles. Hello, I said, and the tall soldier took the butt of his gun and slammed it into my cheek, just like that. I did not even realize when I'd fall into the ground. One of the soldiers held me down with his boot. His boot was so heavy. It was all I could see. And as the others took me, and Beatrice was crying, and I told her, shh, Beatrice, shh. And the soldier marched on over to her and put her boot to her head and smashed it to the ground. And then Beatrice was quiet. Let's bring back out Corrine Duville. So we're opening the morning with fear. Um, you chose a piece of work that I would love for you to tell folks what the written work was, why you chose it, and, and what impact it had on you, especially when it comes to talking about fear. Right. Um, so this piece is Ruined by Lynn Nottage. Um, and it's, it's so incredible incredibly personable to me because the playwright Lynn Nottage actually went to the Democratic Republic of Congo where this play is supposed to take place. And um, if you don't know, they're in the middle of like the civil war and this, these immeasurable strifes that, that are taking place in that country. And um, the people who oftentimes get caught in the middle of these sorts of like um, types of issues in these countries are typically the women. Uh, they are impacted by such inhumane human rights violations. Um, and a very, very big part of that is sexual abuse and rape of the women as they are traded between um, the rebellious soldiers and um, the government soldiers. So I did this because I just feel like it tells a message towards like a real human being and like the, the reality that some of the women in this world have to consistently live in and having to kind of um, navigate through that sort of trauma being your everyday life is something that I felt like I could share with everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. The thing that's going to be interesting, we're going to explore a lot in this block too, is how fear in storytelling, especially when the storytelling is narrative, narrative drama, entertainment, um, can play a role. Um, for those that didn't know, Corrine could have been somebody who was reciting from her own journal, somebody who was from there. And it was important for us to not only talk about the experience of personal storytelling, but how impactful storytelling can be when somebody else is doing the storytelling from 
written stuff. So I love that we kicked off with something super powerful, not my janky ass comedy, um, because I think that it is really shows the level of emotion that we can all rise to. So are you ready to kick off the rest of our fear block? <laughs> That's, I know, that sounds <laughs> terrible. Um, I know, I gotta stop saying that. Just blockages aren't great in general. Um, fear portion. We're gonna have a portion of fear. Just a small helping, but one that's gonna help us learn how to use it and cope and navigate around it. So, um, curating this incredible fear situation. I don't know the word yet. I haven't, I haven't landed on it. Um, is an award-winning filmmaker. Uh, the recipient of the Student Emmy Award. Her, uh, their film, Undercover, was awarded the coveted Princess Grace Award, which is dedicated to identifying and assisting emerging artists. Uh, in 2014, collaborated with the Islamic Scholarship Fund to create the first ever American Muslim film grant that helps filmmakers who are representing positive narratives of Muslims in America. So please welcome the curator of fear, <laughs> Iman Zawari. <laughs> Hello everyone um, and welcome to the Fear Block. So when I'm teaching, the first thing I do is go, hey guys, you ready for class? And everybody has to go, woo! I know it was after that was the fun, but I'm also a comedic filmmaker. So you guys ready for the Fear Block? <laughs> All right. So in this session, we're going to talk about fear. So fear manifests itself in many different ways. So fear is defined as the unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is going to cause danger or harm or threat. So the unpleasant emotion kind of rings true for me. Many things give me an unpleasant emotion, like the Olive Garden. <laughs> yes, or the fear that that was going to bomb. <laughs> yes. um, but this belief that someone or something is in danger is what I want to talk about. So for some, I induce fear. Boo. <laughs> but for me, growing up brown in the South, I was scared all the time. So me and my five brown girlfriends would do adventurous things that kids would do in the days. And I was always the one that was like, hey guys, uh, are you sure you want to do this? Um, can, can we go back home to my uh, Cinnamon Toast Crunch and Care Bears on television? <laughs> I always had that unpleasant emotion. So I was a self-proclaimed chunk from the Goonies. So one time, we were out and we were in the forest, we were going around and we saw this clearing that had farm and animals. And we we're like, oh, a bunch of 10-year-olds are going there, we're super excited. And then all of a sudden, a man with a shotgun comes out and says, hey, y'all, what y'all doing here? And I go, run! And I run as fast as my pudgy little body would allow me. And one by one, my friends passed me by until I was at the end. Guy was yelling in the background, and I yelled out, hey, you guys. <laughs> Reference to the Goonies, if you didn't know. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Liz. So um, in today's current climate, as you've heard many times here at Frank, fear is utilized in almost everything, the media, the administration. And to be honest, watching the State of the Union address on Tuesday, I'm afraid. I'm afraid for myself, I'm afraid for my family, I'm afraid for my students, and moreover, I'm afraid for America. But this is why we are here today, because the best way to combat fear is through knowledge. We have four great speakers that I was able to work with from all around the world, and they're going to be discussing different items such as fear of abundance narrative, fear in film, sexual violence, and body politics. And we're gonna learn how to take this fear and use it for social change. Welcome to the Fear Block. I also love that the curators of these blocks are the least of that, th like she's the least fear, like I love it, like you're just so funny and amazing and I love it. Um, okay, so as I promised, our first speaker um, studies emotion in film and narrative drama, focusing how fear and suspense can deepen engagement. Um, I feel like we are all living right now, as uh, Iman said, in this suspenseful fear space, <laughs> if not in the constant of not knowing because there's no consistent true anymore. Uh, so this to me feels really important as an artist. So he, this is why I'm really excited to hear him talk. He has developed 
a scientific model of audience engagement that helps validate creative storytelling and decisions which deepen engagement and audience experience consistently. So he's going to talk about how the depiction of fear and anxiety in film and television actually can increase the ability to create powerful messages. Please welcome Keith Baum! Well, thanks very much for the warm welcome. Uh, it's such a privilege here to talk today. Um, so, my name is Keith Bound, and I'm going to be talking about how fear and suspense can advance social change. To overcome political and cultural barriers to advancing social change, it is essential that strategic communications generate powerful emotional messages to motivate people to act. Fear is a very powerful emotion that's often used in political discourse to create division in society. But what if fear was combined with suspense to deliver a positive and compelling message that breaks through political and cultural barriers to advance in social change? I shall start today by explaining the science of fear and suspense. The human brain processes fear in 40 milliseconds. Let's put that into context. Most movies create the perception of motion by presenting 25 frames per second. This means that one frame lasts 40 milliseconds, the same time it takes the brain to assess a threatening stimulus and trigger an appropriate response. The reason why the brain reacts so rapidly to a threat is because the brain is hardwired to protect us from harm, making fear a rapid and powerful emotion. When we receive a threat and stimulus, it activates the body warning defense system, the amygdala. This triggers fear appraisal, directing neural messages to the neocortex to retrieve previous memories of threat and stimuli to help assess the threat to life. Simultaneously, the amygdala activates a neural network consisting of the hypothalamus, brainstem and sympathetic nervous system, activating a fight-flight response, leading to increased heart rate, rapid breathing and emotional sweating. These physiological responses instinctively prepare our body to take swift action and to adapt appropriate coping strategies in an attempt to either resolve or avoid the threat. <laughs> <laughs> in the context of someone who is scared of spiders is presented with a spider in an image or movie clip they will react with a strong fear response and adapt appropriate coping strategies even though the spider does not pose any physical harm this is because the brain processes all threat and stimuli in the same way so it's physical, imagined or presented in an image or movie clip when comparing a threatening stimulus presented in an image or movie clip, research studies inform us that a movie clip will create a stronger fear response. This is because a still image does not contain an unfolding narrative, perceived motion or sound. For example, if an image of a spider is presented to the viewer for 10 seconds, the narrative does not change. It is static and silent. Whereas a spider presented in a 10 second movie clip with a frame rate of 25 frames per second will contain 250 images that may also contain different sounds to increase a fear response. When considering the emotion fear in horror movies, Peter Hutchins explains that horror primarily is a sound-based medium where sound and musical scores act as threat and stimuli using dissonance and a tonality to disrupt musical notes and rhythm of sounds, creating a discordant sound that makes the viewer feel uneasy and tense. In some cases, sound and musical scores can be presented as a direct threat to the viewer. For example, the popular musical stinger is a short, loud, discordant sound that's experienced by the viewer as a sudden shot scare moment that makes them jump from their seat. An example of a musical score that's effective in creating a strong fear response is the lesser motive that presents a direct threat to the uh, viewer through a repetition pattern associated with the antagonist 
and the threat they pose other fictional characters. For example, John Williams' famous musical score in the movie Jaws represents a killing machine in the form of a shark. Research studies have found that the emotion of fear in horror movies is synchronised with emotions, interest and anxiety. Because anxiety and fear work together to increase viewer interest. Although surprise and disgust can increase viewer anxiety and fear in horror movies, in the terror and tension study, we discovered that viewers experienced the strongest fear and anxiety response during the construction of suspense. Drawing from film studies and media psychology enabled us to define suspense as the mediating element of a cause and effect paradigm associated with a conflict crisis in the story world or a threatening stimulus directed at the viewer that triggers fluctuations of anxiety. We validated suspense by triangulating three data sets. The first data set is an in-depth textual analysis of three different suspense narrative event structures found in horror movies with a duration of one to 90 seconds. Susan Smith names these narrative structures as direct, shared and vicarious suspense. Direct suspense is when the point of view camera shot is seen in the first person, enabling the viewer to experience suspense directly. Shared suspense is when the protagonist's life is in danger and the viewer and protagonist share similar emotional responses. Vicarious suspense is when the viewer is privileged with information about the dangers that threaten the protagonist's life that they themselves are denied. The second data set measured viewer experience of suspense as an anxiety response. We did this by recording electrical changes in the viewer's skin, measuring anxiety using two variables, duration and intensity. The third data set involved recording viewer verbal feedback responses after watching each movie clip to contextualise their subjective experience of threatening stimuli presented in 32 horror movie clips. The terror and tension study led to the development of a scientific model of fear and suspense that reveals filmmakers' narrative blind spots that significantly reduce story comprehension, attention and engagement. Filmmakers are unaware of narrative blind spots and create them unintentionally because they do not work with a scientific evidence-based model of storytelling that can assist them in making effective creative storytelling decisions that optimise attention and engagement consistently. So can these research outcomes enable storytellers to develop compelling narratives that break through political and cultural barriers to advancing social change? Research studies that compared suspenseful with non-suspenseful commercials found that suspenseful commercials were more engaging, maintain audience attention, and more likely to persuade a viewer to purchase a product or service. Linda Hallowitt discovered that viewers perceive suspenseful commercials as being shorter in their duration because they experience intensified attention and interest. Furthermore, the majority of participants who took part in the terror and tension study said they felt absorbed in the story world when watching horror movie clips, demonstrating that anxiety, fear and suspense engage viewers at a deep emotional level. This informs us that a well-framed strategic message using emotion fear and suspense narrative structures potentially could persuade and motivate viewers to act. In an example of creating social change, emotions disgust and fear were used in a UK government promotional video to stop people smoking cigarettes. The emotion disgust was created visually by presenting a cancer tumour growing from a cigarette, while fear was created by a verbal message stating that it only takes smoking 15 cigarettes for human cells to mutate, making a person vulnerable to cancer. Viewers who were interviewed after watching the video said they found it frightening and prompted them to give up smoking. 
Although this anti-smoking campaign was perceived as being successful, the smoking population reduced by only 1%. This raises the following question. What approaches to storytelling could have been used that would have reduced the smoking population by a greater percentage? Although the UK government promotional video demonstrates negative emotions disgust and fear can deliver a powerful strategic message to advance social change. If filmmakers had knowledge of narrative blind spots and a process to eliminate them, potentially they could have reduced the smoking population by a greater percentage. For example, if they'd used suspense narrative event structures to trigger emotions disgust and fear and embrace the science of storytelling, they could have eliminated narrative blind spots, optimised engagement, and produced a far more compelling strategic message that advances social change. Therefore, compelling strategic communications that embrace the science of storytelling, the emotion, fear, and suspense narrative event structures are more likely to trigger powerful emotional responses required to change people's beliefs, behaviours and break through political and cultural barriers to advance in social change, such as embracing a healthy lifestyle, reversing climate change or eliminating poverty. Thank you for listening. That's true. Although I, have, I love horror, and I have lessened my horror suspense intake in the world we live in. Has anyone else found that to be true? Like the world is so suspenseful and horrifying, I don't need to bring narrative horror into my life. Um, yeah, I know. It's, I wonder if that's affecting. And also, I watch you, which is terrible. Don't watch it. <laughs> terrible. Fail. Um, all right. Hi, come on in. Settle in. Settle in. We're just right here. Yep. Great. Hi, everybody. Good morning. You doing okay? Great. Awesome. You look great. Everybody's doing great. Settling in. I'm a morning person. I apologize. Um, okay. So, coming to our stage now is a professor in the Department of Journalism here at the University of Florida. Uh, her academic research uh, it really focuses on media studies of race, gender, and class. Uh, she's conducted extensive research on social movements, social justice, and black feminism. So today, she's going to talk about how media conversations of immigration around undocumented queer folks and other identities of people of color have created fear and distance instead of emphasizing our shared humanity. So please welcome Rachel Grant. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming out and listening to my uh, talk today. Um, we're going to talk about the undocu queer movement. So we have to first un understand that fear is felt differently by different people. Um, in relation to how we bring fear to a space, a mobility, a proximity. And it's a common misassumption that people who are the most afraid are the most vulnerable. What if it was the complete opposite? What if vulnerability was a permanent part of someone's uh, human existence? So within our media, we see stories that create and focus on producing uh, ideas and practices of difference and conflict. And within these sensationalized single stories, we Fear, this fear, this imminent danger, this imminent perceived threat that we have in our normal lives. Um, and in these stories, we start to think about how we associate fear. And that one way we might start changing our behavior and our ideas and engaging in more oppressive or discriminatory practices, we start using the dehumanizing language that we hear in the media and overall, what we end up doing is shrinking somebody's person's humanity. 
And how that is perceived says a lot about how our society works, how we avoid these feared bodies, and how we force those bodies to take up less space socially, politically, and physically. So within our current debates about US immigration and the LGBT uh, rights and issues, we have tried to address and understand the practices and policies that, can, um, that focus on citizenship and human rights. But at the same time, when we have these conversations, we typically uh, forget and render the people who are the fear deviant bodies and absorb them into our mainstream society. So patterns of discrimination tend to focus and emerge and focus on white, heterosexual, cisgender male bodies. And full citizenship remains elusive for those who are brown, black, queer, and trans. And so within our, this invisibility of undocumented and queer bodies, our stories tend to focus on different issues. And we start to create this imagined queer migrant murderous threat that we see in our society. And we start creating this issue of the health of the imagined national body within our country. So in order to resist this assimilation and create and increase invisibility, increase visibility, uh, the Daku queer movement has emerged. So since 2008, artists and activists like Julio Sadago have created a space where marginalized verses can be heard. And within this movement, we see street art on the streets of California, and we see images being distributed on social media that really talk to us about the experience of what it means to be undocumented and queer. Um, within Sadago's work, he focuses on and really emphasizes this theme of what it means to come out, this dual process of coming out as undocumented and as well as queer. And we see these images emerge in his artwork as he starts to create understandings about what that process might be seen in a visual culture or within visual politics. So in this first image, you'll see, you see this is a self-portrait of Sadago. He's literally hanging by his humanity above the border, the US and Mexican border. We see blood on the American flag. We see his body. On the other side, we see um, the rainbow flag. And we see this exposed understanding of what it means to be vulnerable and being hanging by one's own existence. In other artwork, we see, again, Sadago emphasize the faces and the brown and black faces in this movement. So highlighting the process or seeing this photo, we see somebody being taken into custody by uh, state authorities, ICE. Um, and we see the comparison of the individuals being taken in versus the very blank white faces of state sanctioned violence. And another example of, again, talking about the undocumented experience, talking about labor, talking about these narratives that we hear of migrants being low skilled. Um, and really in this artwork, in celebration of International Workers' Day, Sadago is really talking about the migrant power and how, and really giving a face to what we see that maybe is not seen in our mainstream media. Also within his work, Sadago tends to blur the lines of sexuality and intimacy and relationships by highlighting brown and black individuals in a more um, human existence, showing them that they can love, that they have this non-deviant status as well. And predominantly of all this work that is done by Sadago, for, it forces us to acknowledge how systems of power work. Um, and in conjunction not only to how brown and black and trans and queer individuals work, but really who is this visual uh, storytelling, who's telling those stories. So my call to our, my future communicators and my communicators in the audience is really understand how we can create this master narrative within media and how do we show the complexity of those networks? How do we show the intersections of people's identities that truly we can show that not everybody's experience is the same? 
How can we address issues and bring back humanity to people who truly have this vulnerability at a constant status because of the fear that it is to be them? Um, and as well, exploring different types of artistic expression and activism within our landscape. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Amazing. All right, we're going to do just a really little quick thing. Stand up really quick. Everybody stand up. Pull out your phones. Stand up. Pull up your phones. Stand up. Really, another game? Yeah. Phones? Phones out. Everybody's phones out. Silence your phones. That is the exercise. I love you, but I think it's important. Like, we can get up, you get early, you get your coffee, you get your shit. You're like, I forgot to turn my phone off. Damn. And so now nobody has to be that person. We're nailing it. You guys are great. Right? Look at that. We stretched. We turned our phones off. We are all present and amazing. And I'm wearing plaid again. In fact, look at the back. What? I had to. $6 flea market. That is all my life is, a $6 flea market. Hi, I'm Liz, $6 flea market, Winstead. Let's move on. I love this block because it's like fear as like figuring it out for yourself and not being like afraid. Like I think those two things are different sometimes, right? Fear and not being afraid. You can use your fear for power. So let's do that. Coming up, are you ready? Now that nothing's gonna bother you because your phones are off, I feel confident bringing up our next speaker. <laughs> Head of research at the Berkeley Media Studies Group, which works on training advocates and community leaders to communicate strategically. Um, and to conduct media advocacy that makes their communities healthier, safer, and more just. She's part of a five-year study. I love five-year studies. <laughs> I'm a big fan of the five-year study. Like, I know you think I'm shitting you right now, but like they just did a five-year study on people who've had abortions, and turns out none of them ever regretted it ever, and they found relief as their number one thing. So like, studying comprehensive five-year things is my jam. If I had a jam in research, it would be that. Um, so five-year study that um, explored what it takes to make the case for preventing sexual assault, abuse, and really making sure that when we talk about harassment, um, we're talking about it in a way that gets, that's compelling and gets people to really want to prevent it and participate in that. So what she's going to be discussing today is the importance of being aspirational and having a space to talk about our fear. So please welcome Pamela Mejia! <laughs> Exactly. The pain is me staying alone, feeling you out, and my satisfactory. Today I'm thinking about right. <laughs> Speaking of fear, you can see my hands shaking a little bit. <laughs> doing great. Love it. Thank you for that aspirational language. Morning, everyone. Pleasure to be here. This isn't usually how I like to start my Thursdays, but I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> That is, how do you feel when you look at these pictures? So if I had to guess, I would speculate kind of a combination of anger and anxiety and disgust and fear. Because no matter what our experience is with sexual violence, whether we've experienced it ourselves, know someone who has, or just follow the stories in the news, rape, sexual harassment, and sexual abuse, they frighten us. Now, fear would seem like it's a pretty big barrier to communicating effectively and strategically about prevention and getting people involved in preventing and reducing violence. But in fact, it's a tool. It helps us actually change hearts and minds and illustrate to people that sexual violence is not some intractable, inevitable <coughs> horror, but instead is a deeply entrenched social problem that, we all, that can be prevented and that we all have a stake in. But let me back up. <laughs> My name is Pamela Mejia, as you heard, and I'm head of research at Berkeley Media Studies Group. And these questions are not hypothetical for me. This has been my whole life for about now the last seven years, since the National Sexual Violence Resource Center approached my organization and asked, can you help us get better at talking about prevention and why it matters? Now, at the time, I was a brand new mom to, is it gonna work for me? Oh, hello. Hi there, I don't want to look at Jeffrey Epstein. Uh-oh, 
Now back. Hold on. <laughs> what a gift. What a dream. OK, there we go. So at the time, I was a brand new mom to a little girl. So those fears and anxieties weren't hypothetical for me either. They were personal. I was afraid. But I'm a researcher, so I started researching. The first part of that research involved a lot of listening, interviews and focus groups, talking with the experts, the people whose job it is to talk about preventing and reducing violence every day, where they stumbled and where they shown, what questions they still had, what made their jobs harder or easier. And as I talked to these folks, I heard again and again the same anxieties and fears that I myself felt, but I also heard passion and commitment and hope. These folks wanted to change the way that we talk about sexual violence, to ensure that when we do, we're not only talking about punishing perpetrators or supporting victims, but that we're also talking about what it takes to stop violence before it happens, before anyone gets hurt. Perhaps not surprisingly, a lot of them spoke also about the importance of aspirational language, of painting a picture of the world we want to see, a world without sexual violence, without harm, where everyone is safe, what I call the golden horizon. But what was a lot less clear was how to get there. So with what felt like a lot more questions than answers, I'm sure many in this room can, can understand, we started a message testing process where we worked with people from all around the country, hundreds of them, lots of all different backgrounds, all different levels of experience with sexual violence. A lot of what we learned about effective prevention communication is not going to be all that novel to experienced communicators like those in this room, right? Lead with values, avoid jargon. But one of the things that I want to focus on right now is this second bullet point, this piece of the, that felt a little less intuitive for me. This piece about acknowledging fear, acknowledging negative emotions. Because what we quickly learned in the process of message testing was that because we all have such deeply felt and entrenched beliefs and emotions about sexual violence, Broad aspirational statements just didn't cut it. They didn't feel real for people. In fact, when they heard these messages, they dismissed them out of hand as irre irrelevant, as out of touch, and they dismissed messengers as condescending, as disconnected from real life. It felt like we weren't getting anywhere. It felt like we weren't getting anywhere as I'm not with my slides. Uh, <laughs> but then we started realizing that as we dug in deeper, we were able to change people's perspectives on prevention and their role in it. But only when we first acknowledged, named those ugly, dark emotions of doubt and fear and rage and pain that were so quickly lost when we talked only about the aspirational, only about the golden horizon. When people heard those fears reflected back to them, they saw them as real and grounded in reality and valid. They were able to confront and face them better. And they saw the speakers as people who were in the struggle with them. And that helps them keep their minds more open to talking then about solutions and what role they could play in reducing or preventing violence. Of course, it's not just enough to acknowledge fear, say it out loud. As that previous slide I had indicated, we also have to have a place that people can go to, right? We're not just helping them navigate those negative emotions. We have to have a destination. So some kind of concrete, tangible illustration of what prevention can look like in that audience's sphere of influence, whether it's advocating for funding or training teachers or any number of other things. But again, once people heard their fears and doubts reflected back to them and validated and confirmed, they were more likely to stay open to talking about what they could do to be part of that act, whatever it was, because they saw that their fears and their doubts did not have, to, while real, did not have to be the end of the story. I do a lot of training on sexual violence prevention communication, and usually right around this time, I see some extremely skeptical looks. I'm just supposed to validate every crazy thing, every fear everybody's ever had about rape and sexual assault? Not quite. So they said, it's really only about confirming for people that you hear, acknowledge, and respect the fears that they hold, that they're bringing to the conversation with you. And that can be done very simply, even with just a few words or phrases, like the ones on the screen. Now, 
Most of my work is centered on sexual violence prevention, but I also want to flag that anecdotally, I've seen that this kind of validation and acknowledgement can be really powerful in helping people navigate their emotions about a lot of complex issues. Even just acknowledging that, hey, there's a lot of confusing and scary information in the news can help people work through their feelings about issues from gun control to cancer. But like any, any skill, Acknowledging and validating fears is, is a challenge. It can be a challenge, and it is indeed a skill. And it's not always easy, even for me after seven years. But what helps me is to remember that we all want to get to that golden horizon, that safe world, that world where I never have to, uh, uh, to evoke another Bill Cosby or Jeffrey Epstein because they never hurt anybody to start with. And if we want to get there, if we want to all get there, we have to meet people where they are and help them on their journey. So I encourage all of you here to think about the issues that you're working on and the negative emotions people might hold. And think about how you can reflect and acknowledge those emotions back to people and help them work through them in a way that feels right for you. Because when we do that, when we do that, we can help show people that even a goal as big as reducing violence isn't some impossible dream that only belongs to a few people that social change is happening every single day and everywhere, and that we all have a right and a responsibility to act, whoever and wherever we are, no matter how afraid. Amazing. Um, Fear is our friend. It's familiar. That's what I think. All right. Now, coming up is an incredible woman who works across so many platforms. She's the co-founder of the Alameda Know Your Rights Committee, which trains people with citizenship privilege to assist immigrants in the event of an ICE raid. Crucial. Also on the board of the directors of the Guttmacher Institute, which advances sexual and reproductive health worldwide. And for the past 15 years, she has revolutionized the training of worker spokespeople. So bringing them inside strategies so they can be the most effective and, pa and passionate uh, spokespeople for the change they want to see. Today, uh, I love this. Uh, they're going to be talking about a conversation of how ab abundance seeking, or uh, as she has uh, coined, the, the fixed pie fallacy. Uh, as is bringing fear, right? There's a pie, there's a limited amount, and then if you don't get any, and other people are taking your pie, and like, rights aren't pie, but like, we have to keep telling people, like, shut up about your pie. <laughs> Some people like macaroni and cheese, which does a slop fest and is a portioning that is like variancing. So I'm really excited to break down that pie fallacy and talk about things in a different way so that we understand sharing and, and our abundance as a gift and that makes us stronger. So please welcome Amanda Cooper. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. A special shout out to the fellow West Coasters because it's real early. <laughs> um, so, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I want to start by reminding us that there is enough of everything for everyone. Right? And anyone who, thank you. <laughs> and anyone who tells you otherwise is trying to scare you. Right? They're trying to to pick up that fear that we have that there won't be enough for ourselves or our families or our community. And they're trying to use that because they're hoarding wealth and power. And if we're fighting amongst ourselves, then we're not fighting them, right? So that shows up in many spaces. Immigration is the most commonly referenced. Um, when certain politicians say they are coming to take our jobs, we know that that's not how the economy works. The economy grows when, it, when people participate in it. But you also see it when low-wage employers tell us you can't raise wages because prices will go up and we'll all be poorer. Um, people who don't want you to have universal health care will say, the wait times, the lines, with this ridiculous notion that somehow if we all have health care, none of us will have health care. <laughs> 
this is how it shows up. And economists call it the fixed pie fallacy. I don't call it, the economists call it that. Um, because it's not true. It's a pie, the pie is not one size. The pie grows and contracts depending on how we're b baking it, if you will. Um, but again, the wealth and power hoarders, if they can have us look at that pie and how we slice it, then we're not looking at them. So the challenge, though, for me is that I'm finding that this fallacy is also underlying some of our work, some of our change-making work. And when we reinforce it, we end up reinforcing some really problematic things. For example, this is a billboard that I passed in California many times. Um, to be perfectly honest, if I stop and think about it, I don't really know what this billboard's trying to say. I think it's trying to make the case for education, but is it making the case for education because education is cheaper? If somehow if we lowered the cost of mass incarceration, would that make it a good idea? Doesn't seem like it, right? Um, this is a meme that I admit I, I shared this, okay? A few years ago when the Trump administration said that they were going to um, eliminate health care for trans people in the military, gender affirming care, and they said it was so expensive. And so the Rand Corporation put out this comparative um, fact that, you know, transition related care is $8.4 million or less and the military spends $84 million on erectile dysfunction drugs. And I was outraged. That's ridiculous. And then I took a step back and realized, wait, I am I'm firmly, pun intended, pun not intended, I'm sure, <laughs> firmly of the belief that sexual health is health. Right? And I, if people need erectile dysfunction drugs, I want them to have them. My values are that everyone gets the health care they need. And this comparison minimizes somebody's care in the service of someone else's care. That's not my values. That's not how I feel. The military of all institutions can afford all the health care. We don't need to choose. But yet, these are the messages that we send when we, when we are, because we have also internalized the fixed pie fallacy. Why is this a problem beyond this? Because it shows up in ways that we don't even realize. Do you remember the marriage equality struggle when people said things like, but what about my marriage? Do you remember that? And I thought, did, you heard that, right? What about your marriage? Like, what the hell does this have to do? But I, it's finally dawned on me they think love and respect are a fixed pie, you guys. There's only so much marriage sanctity to go around. <laughs> and, if we, and if we split, if we add more people, right, to that institution, somehow your slice of it gets smaller. And then it really made sense around All Lives Matter. Now, we have to be clear that the response to Black Lives Matter is also rooted in anti-blackness. Cannot forget that. But all lives matter is a fixed pie argument. If black lives matter enough, as much as they should, what does that say for other lives? So how do we fight this? We have to fight it by remembering and affirming that our most precious resources are truly infinite. Safety, love, respect, justice. These aren't, all, these aren't only infinite, right? They get better, stronger, the more of us have them, right? If you're safer, I'm safer. If you're treated with love and respect, chances are I will be too. So this is what we have to reinforce all the time. This is the truth. These are abundant, infinite resources that grow when they grow. So how we do this is we message for abundance. We remind people life is not a pie, it is a potluck, yeah. right? <laughs> Yes, you've been to a potluck with too much wine, not enough dessert, right? But we work it out. Everybody brings something, everybody, you know, contributes what they can, and we work it out. We have to tell the truth that we are the richest country that has ever existed in the history of the planet, and whatever we want to do, we can do. It is not a matter of whether we have the resources, it's about how we choose to implement and use them. And all of our messaging and all of our campaigns have to reinforce that, and when they do, we're all of a sudden in a positive frame. We're in a yes and campaign space where we can all, and our messages are aligning without more meetings, which we all know we're trying to avoid. Um, here's a few campaigns I'd love to share with you. We're gonna talk about these in the recess, but these were all campaigns that have successfully entered a fixed pie universe with an abundant frame and won. Um, and we can talk about these more later, but it, it happens, it's real, you can do it. Um, Ultimately, I want you to ask you to make what we call the potluck promise. Can you promise 
to com can you commit to rejecting scarcity and embracing abundance in your work? Will you please not off, thank you. <laughs> Will you please, please stop offering our liberation at a discount? Yeah. Right? Don't cost compare. Don't, you know, do the cost benefit analysis. Don't rank deservedness, right? Step away from any conversation that asks you to rank our needs and desires or, or who deserves things. And I promise you that if you make this promise, your campaigns will become more interesting, more effective, more liberating, and more aligned. So what do you think? You gonna come to the potluck? Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh yes, give me. Oh my God. Well, I'm bringing a hot dish. Because I'm from Minnesota. And we don't have casseroles. We have a hot dish. Understanding. Um, that's the end of our first block. Let's have a little recap, shall we? Oh my God, let's bring Iman back up to talk about what, I know, great curation. Hey, thank friend. you. I'm oh, so proud God. of them. It was amazing. So, none of those people were scary. No, they weren't. And all, like, you had a bunch of takeaways. So, um, why don't you just dive into, like, when you heard all of these talks and what people were going to bring, like what, what your takeaways were as you coached these folks? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, as you guys saw from Amanda, my um, biggest takeaway was the potluck promise. And seeing all four of them, and I love how it kind of came together, is this potluck promise and having this, this for you guys to go out there and share everything. And it, was, it seems like it's something obvious, but it's not. Right. So um, the concept of this potluck promise was very um, moving for me, and I hope, and I see it was for you guys as well. Um, another one is the Undocu Queer movement. It is such a um, niche within a niche, right? Mm -hmm. And the takeaway for that for us is like go into your communities, learn them, understand them, see what is the niche of the niche so that you can tell and share up with others, taking that fear away. And of course, the sexual violence as well is just validating the way that someone feels. And um, you know, having being honest and understanding them. I, all of these things were just like, I was like, I, we, we rehearsed these so many times, and every single time I was like getting ch chills and, and getting emotional about it, because I'm like, wow, this is just, we're changing the world. Yeah. You know, and they're just such, they're basic things that you think we would know, but we need to push it out to our communities. Well, and I think too, like, closing out with the potluck promise, and then looking at what people bring to the potluck, whether it's the docu-queer experience, whether it's the experience of somebody who's been in sexual violence, you know, all of those things come to this potluck space and centers all the different people's experiences as if the dishes, if you will, and then we have those conversations and we share them and, we, and, and our plate just grows as we put it on and who needs plates? Just throw it down, you know? It's like, I, you know, use and I just, hands. yeah, use your hands. Like, and I just feel like that, that, that was my big takeaway, was just looking at this space and talking about our fears are always because of our unknowns. Right. And it is just always opening up and understanding that the worst thing that happens is that you gain knowledge. Exactly. Like, that is the worst thing that yeah. can happen. And so, if that's the worst thing that can happen, get your potluck on. Exactly. Yeah. Come um, to my house. That's right. Yes, exactly. Do it. So incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Incredible. Yeah. Um, really great. Thanks. Um, I need to walk off. Do I stay here? You can stay here. <laughs> you know, I feel like you're fine. I'm not afraid of you. OK. Um, <laughs> boo. So um, do you want to help me read this? It's really fun. See my giant old person wow. okay, boomer font? Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm hey, blind. Karen. I know, it's so sad. Um, so, breakout sessions are happening now. Um, as you know, they're in the back of your book. You can check them out. There'll be your guidepost will be outside to get you to your breakouts. Um, we will be back here at 11.25, so we can kick into the next session. Um, and enjoy your breakouts, and we'll see you back here. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.